Welcome to the National Science Day. I'm Ramana Atreya, an astronomer at the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Pune. I will introduce you to an exciting event which happened a couple of months ago, which is the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll first give you an overview. It's a space telescope. It's a six and a half meter diameter mirror. It's an infrared telescope. Infrared is not quite the same as the visible electromagnetic radiation that we use to see the objects in the universe around us. This telescope is named after an administrator at NASA who led the organization in the 1960s. The telescope was first proposed in 1980s, but it was only launched 41 years later in 2021. The estimated final cost is 10 billion US dollars. And Towards the end, I will take you through some of the astrophysical goals that astronomers are very excited about pursuing with this telescope. It will look at the oldest and the most distant objects in the universe. It's all, it will also look at some of the coldest objects, uh, cosmic gas and dust, which is where stars are born in the universe. And it will help us understand a bit more about exoplanets. Exoplanets are extrasolar planets, that is planets which are found outside our solar system. This gives you a picture of all the different telescopes which are in space. There are dozens and dozens of them and that immediately brings us to the question of why we want to put telescopes up in space. The primary reason why astronomers want to have telescopes in space even though it is very expensive, I gave you a price of uh, 10 billion dollars that this telescope has cost. The same telescope had it been installed on earth would have cost about a tenth perhaps. But the reason why astronomers want such telescopes in space if they can manage to do so is because of the atmosphere. The atmosphere of earth consists of largely nitrogen, some amount of oxygen and trace amount of other chemicals. But these atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, they absorb photons, they scatter photons and then they smudge the image. All of these processes reduce our ability to detect faint objects and also to get high quality images. These are actually not different processes. All these processes are related to how photons and matter interact with each other when they collide. And that is what we will look at next. But before that, I will introduce you to something called the electromagnetic spectrum, which many of you may already know of. What we understand as light is that part of the electromagnetic spectrum which is used by the human eye to see the world around us. That is just this very narrow part of it. Electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic radiation which is covers the entire spectrum is distinguished by the frequency of the radiation. You can have electromagnetic radiation which extends from 10 to the power of 6 hertz all the way to 10 to the power of 20 hertz. Hertz is a unit that physicists use to indicate how many times does uh, a wave oscillates in a given in a second, right? These electromagnetic radiations are actually waves of electricity and magnetism and the number of times they oscillate per second whether it's 1 million times or whether it is 100 billion billion times decides what kind of a radiation it is. We are normally familiar with two kinds of electromagnetic radiation. One is the visible that I already talked to you about. The other is the radio radiation or radio waves or radio photons and that is used in your communication networks, whether your mobile phones or television uh, signals or radio signals and so on. But the full range of electromagnetic radiation which is what is called the electromagnetic spectrum is much wider. And astronomers would like to study objects using telescopes across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The frequency of the electromagnetic radiation is inversely proportional to its wavelength. Also, the energy of the electromagnetic radiation is proportional to its frequency. So, as the frequency increases, the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation reduces and the energy of the electromagnetic radiation increases. Let us take a look at some of the interactions which occurs between matter and photon because of which the atmosphere come in, comes in the way of astronomical observations. First of all, 
any atom as you know consists of a nucleus which consists of protons and neutrons and electrons which are circling around it. When a photon of whatever energy collides with such an atom, it passes on its energy to the electron and gives it a little kick. right? So, when such a thing happens, if the photon transfers all of its energy to the electron, then that photon is no longer available to be detected by a telescope on the surface of the earth. Since the atmosphere is very large, the probability that such a photon would collide with a atom is high and therefore, the atmosphere attenuates a lot of the photons because of these collisions. What I have shown you here is the hydrogen atom, it consists of a single proton in the nucleus and there are these different rings that you see out here which are indicated by something called a quantum number n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and all, all the way to n is equal to infinity. These are at different distances from the nucleus and electrons in them have different levels of energy. So, when a photon collides with an electron, it gets kicked upwards and if the amount of energy transferred is sufficient, then it completely escapes from the clutches of the nucleus. And in such a situation, we say that the electron has become free and left behind an ionized atom behind, which is just a positive charge here and the electron has broken away. This happens when the radiation energy, that is the energy of the photon is at least 13.6 electron volts, which corresponds to photons whose wavelength is smaller than 912 angstroms. So, all those photons whose wavelength is shorter than this will be efficiently absorbed by atoms in the atmosphere. We also have other ways in which photons and matter interact. For example, you may have heard of something called the ionosphere which is found as a layer of ionized material or plasma some distance above the earth's surface and any plasma has something called a plasma frequency depending on its density of electrons. And if there is any radiation which is passing or impinges on the plasma below the plasma frequency for the ionosphere it is about 10 to 30 megahertz. When the frequency is less than the plasma frequency, the plasma does not allow the radiation to pass through it. It gets reflected back from where it came from in the direction that it came from. This is somewhat analogous to the total internal reflection that we have come across perhaps in a swimming pool if you have uh, seen it there. Only those radiations which have frequencies above the plasma frequencies will be able to go through. right? The, in fact, this is why your mobile phones and your TV signals which have frequencies much higher than the plasma frequency of the ionosphere cannot be uh, seen unless we are somewhere along the line of sight to them. So, if you have one antenna here, your receiver antenna here and your transmitting antenna on the other side because of curvature of earth, these higher frequencies cannot actually be detected here because they will just pass through the ionosphere. On the other hand, if you ever heard a radio, radios have frequencies which are lower than 10 to 30 megahertz which is less than the plasma frequency and since they get bounced back by the ionosphere, you can detect them and listen to your radio programs even if you are on the other side of the earth. For astronomers, this situation is actually reversed. We can only, if you put a telescope on earth, you can only see those frequencies which are higher than the plasma frequencies because the cosmic signal has to pass through the ionosphere and come to the terrestrial surface where the telescope is situated. So, any lower frequency radiation coming from cosmic uh, objects will not be able to pass through the ionosphere. They will get bounced upwards and we will never be able to detect them. There are other ways in which molecules and atoms can absorb photons. These are the vibrational and rotational modes of molecules which I have shown here. Just like electrons in orbits around the nucleus can absorb energy and go to higher levels of activity or higher levels of energy, molecules can absorb such photons and start rotating faster or start vibrating faster resulting in fewer photons available to see on the surface of earth. 
the net result of all this is that the atmosphere is largely opaque across most of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you go to very low wavelengths, which is very high frequencies, your gamma ray, x ray, and ultraviolet, almost no photons come through. Only a small fraction of ultraviolet photons come through, and no photons come through in the very long wavelength radio regime. There is only this one large window in the radio regime between wavelengths of about 1 centimeter to about 10 meters, where the atmosphere is more or less opaque. And then there are these narrow windows in the optical or infrared, especially in the optical, where the photons largely come through unattenuated. There is a 10 percent loss in the visible photons, that is these are the photons that we see with our eye. And there are a few narrow uh, wavelengths where the infrared photon comes through, but by and large the atmosphere is opaque. So, what happens when photons come through? Uh, the atmosphere and most of them get absorbed. So, that process of absorption is called atmospheric attenuation because the number of photons coming through reduces. When this happens, the, our ability to detect sources in the sky and to get a good image of their structure reduces. For example, all images that we take with a telescope has two components. There is something called the background noise, which is called the instrumental noise and then the signal from the target. The instrumental noise or the background noise is this uh, black and white pepper texture that you see here, right? It is random uh, uh, pattern here. And the signal that we actually see are, are these bright spots. These are the stars and those are galaxies and we see there is a range of brightness in these objects that we are trying to study. What matters for the quality of the image is the relative strength of the objects that we are trying to st study and the background. And you see here that when the background is high, many of the objects that are visible in this part of the image where the background is low are no longer visible. And that is what happens because of attenuation. Attenuation reduces the signal coming through the atmosphere of these objects that we are trying to study. And because of that, we lose detail in the image and we lose the faint sources. It is very obvious here that the number of sources which are seen on this image where the background is high is much smaller. Also, this diffuse gas which is found around the stars are no longer visible or only very faintly visible on this part of the image. So, this is the first problem of atmospheric attenuation. Then this is something we are familiar with. The atmosphere scatters incoming visible light. This happens in the daytime the sun is so bright that even if a small fraction of its light is scattered in different directions, the brightness of the sky increases so much that we do not see any of the stars. Even though the stars are actually there, we cannot see it because of the scattered light due to the atmosphere. right? But not only does the atmosphere scatter sunlight, but it also scatters starlight. Even though the amount of starlight coming through is very small, that is sufficient to obscure the even fainter objects that we are generally trying to detect. A third thing which happens because of the atmosphere is that your earth, the earth that we live on and the lower atmosphere has a temperature of about 300 Kelvin. 300 Kelvin does not sound like a very hot temperature, but we are trying to actually detect objects which are a few tens of Kelvin, which is a 10 times fainter. And just like in the case of the sun, when you have a very bright object, you cannot see any other object close to it because your eyes are sort of blinded. Similarly, telescopes also get blinded when there is a very bright uh, background here. So, this fact that this sky has a background of 300 Kelvin means that we cannot see some of the fainter objects, especially in the infrared. In any case, you can ask, look, there is this broad window in the radio and few windows in the infrared and this uh, visible window, why do not we confine our telescopes to observing in just these parts of the electromagnetic spectrum? Why do we need to have telescopes all across the spectrum? And the reason why we want to observe right across the electromagnetic spectrum is because objects can look very different at different wavelengths, right? Because different astrophysical phenomena result in radiation coming at different wave bands. And studies across the entire spectrum is necessary for a comprehensive understanding of the object. For example, 
I have shown you here what is called the ring nebula. The image on the right is the optical image and it is the same object on the left which is an infrared image. This entire bright thing that we see in the optical image is actually just the central part of it. And in infrared image, you also see a lot of shells of dust. It is almost like there has been an explosion and shells of dust are being thrown outwards from the central objects. We would never have understood the complete nature of this object, but for this infrared image. Similarly, there is this very famous object called the Crab Nebula. This is one of those things which have been known to humanity for many centuries, almost for, for a thousand years. And these are the different images of that single object in different wave bands. This is the visible light, ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays and radio. And what you see here is the X-ray that we are looking at is only occupying a small portion of what can be seen in the visible part of the spectrum. This is the infrared image. Therefore, we want to have telescopes which can provide you information right across the electromagnetic spectrum in order to understand the complete astrophysical phenomenon of that object. Apart from the issue of the atmosphere itself, any telescope on earth is contaminated by signals that human societies generate. You have street lights which brighten the sky. The sky in the cities seem to have far fewer stars than the sky in the wilderness. That is because the street lights increase the background and you do not see too many faint objects. Similarly, many of the light sources that we use like sodium vapor lamp and mercury vapor lamp provide you spectral lines which interfere with the what the telescope is trying to observe. If you have any hot object like for example, an industrial zone near an infrared telescope, it will reduce the sensitivity of the telescope considerably. Furthermore, in the radio as I told you, your mobiles, handsets, your TV stations. Uh, are all radiating electromagnetic radiation. Also high tension wires radiate electromagnetic waves. The, any sparking, we all have sparking when you have two high tension wires coming close to each other. All such phenomenon will result in very bright emission of electromagnetic radiation. The problem is that the telescopes that astronomers build are used to measure cosmic signals which are very faint. In fact, the cosmic signals are so faint that we measure the strength of the signal in terms of 10 to the power of minus 26 watts per meter square per hertz. In fact, my favorite way of demonstrating how small the signal is that telescopes detect is that if you collected all the radio photons which have been received by all the radio telescopes in this world for the last 80 years since radio astronomy first started the total amount of energy co collected during this entire time by all the telescope is less than the amount of energy it takes to turn one sheet of paper. That is how faint the signals are that astronomers use to understand uh, all that large variety of phenomenon. And you can see that when there are these very, very strong signals coming from man-made sources, uh, your telescopes will be pretty much useless. Finally, one major problem of the atmosphere is that it reduces the detail with which one can observe the sky. The amount of detail in an image that a telescope can provide is called as diffraction limit. This is a theoretical limit comes from basic physics principles. But this detail, the amount of detail that you can get, it is called as resolution actually, that is a technical term but I will use the word detail here. The amount of detail you can get an image increases with the size of the telescope. The larger the telescope you have, theoretically you should get more detail and it decreases with the wavelength of operation. Right? For the same size of the telescope, a visible uh, or optical telescope will give you more detail than an infrared telescope, which will give you much more detail than a radio telescope. To give you some perspective, the moon subtends an angle of 31 arc minutes on the sky. On the other hand, our eye can see a detail at about 1 arc minute. 1 arc minute is uh, 1 60th of a degree. Right? These are very small numbers. And typically, ground based telescopes give you detail at the level of about 1 25th to 300 times the detail that you can get with the human eye. Right? So, this is what you want to aim for. 
But the problem with this is, this limit is not set by the size of the telescope. This limit is actually set by the turbulence in the atmosphere. You come across turbulence in the atmosphere, it is what causes the stars to twinkle. Twinkling of a star is basically instability of its position and uh, structure as seen from earth. And you can see that if there is very high degree of twinkling, your image will dance around on your telescope uh, camera and you will not see much detail. The atmosphere smudges out the detail. In fact, the twinkling in the atmosphere limits the detail to what you can see with a 20 centimeter telescope. We have now telescopes which go up to 10 meters on earth or even larger, this is optical telescopes, but any telescope larger than 20 centimeter does not gain the increase in detail that we want. So, your bigger telescopes, are 4 meters, 6 meters, 8 meters or 10 meter telescope can detect fainter objects, but we cannot get finer details because of this turbulence in the atmosphere. So, here is an example that if you put a telescope in space, you have a comparison of the same image, same object imaged using a ground based telescope. Subaru is a Japanese telescope of size 8 meters, the size of its mirror is 8 meters and it is one of the finest telescopes on earth and this is the Hubble Space Telescope that you might all have heard of and this is only a 2.4 meter telescope, but you can see that the amount of detail that you can see with a telescope in space is much, much higher than the amount of detail in the ground based telescope, even though the ground based telescope is much larger, that is because of turbulence in the atmosphere. So, for all these reasons, astronomers like to send their telescopes into space because it gives you much crisper images and more sensitive images. Now, the question comes up if you send it into space, as you know space is very large, what would be the best location to put it? I would not go into a huge detail on this. There is a favorite place of astronomers to put really big and expensive telescopes and that is something called the L2 Lagrangian point. Suppose you have two bodies interacting with each other gravitationally, like for example, the sun and the earth. You know that the gravitational attraction of the sun causes the earth to go around it, right? because the gravitational attraction of the sun is very powerful. But you can see that if you are at a point which is sufficiently close to earth, because the gravitational attraction not only depends on the mass of which the sun has a huge amount, but also depends on the square of the distance, inverse square of the distance. So, if you go to a place which is sufficiently close to earth, you will find a point where the gravitational attraction of the sun and the earth cancels each other out exactly. That is called the first Lagrangian point, right. So, even though the earth's mass itself is so much smaller. So, there are several other Lagrangian points. The important one for us is this L2. I will not go into the others, but you can go to a Wikipedia page and learn more about this. At this location L2, which lies just beyond the earth, well just beyond is in astronomical terms, it is about a million kilometers beyond the earth, but it is on the line joining the sun to the earth, sun L1 earth L2. The speciality of this point is that any object which is placed at L2 will rotate around the sun at the same speed as earth, it will take exactly 365 days. Why is that important? It is important because if you keep the uh, your telescope right at that L2 point, it will always be at a fixed position relative to the sun earth axis. It will be revolving around the sun in exactly the same speed as the earth, which is one year and therefore, effectively that telescope is fixed. There are many things that you can do with a space telescope, which makes things convenient. For example, communication with the earth to send data back to earth, because you want the telescope to be able to send the data back to earth. So, you want it to be in a fixed place that makes it much more convenient. So, the James Webb telescope has been put at this L2 Lagrangian point. This is what the telescope looks like. It has got a primary mirror, which is actually made up of beryllium. It consists of 18 panels and the total diameter is six and a half meters and the coating on this mirror is actually of gold. Gold is much better than uh, aluminum. Your terrestrial telescopes of the visible light have uh, coatings of uh, aluminum, but this has gold because gold has much better infrared reflection properties. So, this is what the telescope looks like. There is signal coming from outer space 
from cosmic objects, it gets reflected from this gold plated large mirror, it is called the primary mirror, it gets reflected back into something called the secondary mirror, which is again reflects it into the instrumentation. There is instrumentation sitting inside this central block that you see here. So, this is what it looks like. Apart from this, there is something called the sun shield because there is an infrared telescope which can be seriously contaminated or damaged or uh, made less effective by heat and the sun is a very hot object. So, you want to make sure that the radiation from the sun does not come and heat up your electronics. So, this sun shield is the protection against the radiation from the sun. This whole structure needs to be kept at a uh, temperature of 50 degrees Kelvin, it is very, very cold and the amount of sunlight is high enough to heat it up. That is the other advantage of sitting at the L2 Lagrangian point because all you have to do is to put the sun shield on one side and it will forever be obscuring the sun uh, and stopping it from heating the uh, telescope. These are some of the details I already talked about. I will not go into it, you can go to the Wikipedia page and get more, uh, more details of that. And these are the instruments that astronomers have put in there. So, this is, this is the secondary mirror, this structure, this grey structure you see is the primary mirror and just behind the primary mirror, which is behind this black block that you see here, are the instrumentation. And the instrument consists of a near infrared imager and spectrograph. We will come to the meaning of what a spectrograph is. The imager is whatever gives you images like this. It, it takes a photograph of the sky. And there is a mid infrared imager. As I told you, this is a infrared telescope. The near infrared imager gives you images between 0.6 and 5 microns and the mid infrared imager gives you images between 5 and 27 microns. And there are a couple of other uh, sensors which uh, are used to point the telescope in the right direction for whatever object you want to study. This again is the rest of the structure, it consists of a command structure which tells the telescope where to point, how long to point and this computation because you want to be able to control the telescope, data handling, communication back to earth and there is a cooler which keeps the even at outer space which is very cold, detectors can heat up because of the electronic current in the electronics itself, the electric current in the electronics. So, there is a cryo cooler which cools it to below 50 Kelvin, then there is a solar panel which generates small amount of energy to move the telescope whenever it is required and so on. And there are radiators, these, these panels are radiators, the green panel is a solar panel and these grey panels are radiators which eliminate heat. So, I will quickly go through some of the interesting aspects here. This telescope project was first discussed in 1980, that is a long time ago. That's 40, 42 years ago. The detailed planning started in 96. The proposed budget was 500 million US dollars and it was scheduled for launch in 2007. But the assembly itself was only completed in 2016. The final launch was two months ago and the final cost was 10 billion dollars, a large difference between the numbers proposed initially and the numbers later. Part of the problem is that for a space telescope, you have to make sure everything is working perfectly. You have to make sure that even small problems do not occur because you cannot send a mechanic out to space to make the correction. So, in fact, between 2016 and 2022, they spent 5 or 6 years just testing the telescope for all kinds of things which can go wrong and they had to make the instrument extremely robust. One of the problems with telescopes like this, because they take 10, 20, 30, 40 years to build is that you have to freeze the technology sometime, you have to freeze the design and the plans and say I shall build it with whatever technology is available today. But it also means that since technology is changing very rapidly, the technology today is not what it was 5 years ago, it is progressing very rapidly. In some sense, most telescopes are already obsolete by the time you send them up because you are working with technology which is already 10 or 20 years old. Right? That is part of the problem, but that is that's what it is with telescopes because they take such a long time to build and send up. They are usually using the previous generation electronics and technology. Other aspects, it was an international effort though largely driven by US funding, it is a technology demonstrator. Many people ask what is the point of building telescopes like this which cost such a lot of money. But a lot of the technology developed for telescopes usually find commercial use subsequently. It has been criticized for various reasons. One is the enormous 
increase of time and cost, consumed a lot of funding which could perhaps have supported other astronomy research. And one other aspect is that James Webb was not a scientist, he is actually a, the head of the programs of uh, NASA. Uh, he was a senior administrator of the Apollo space program which put people into uh, on the moon, Americans on the moon. But the reason they named it after him because he was one of those administrators who strongly pushed the research orientation of that organization. And in his honor because he understood 60 years ago how important research is to be part of the space program they named this telescope after him. So now let us take a look at the science uh, with the James Webb telescope. As I told you it is an infrared telescope and the importance of infrared telescopes is that it probes a different set of astrophysical phenomena compared to visible light, x-ray and radio telescopes. For example, you see on the panel on the right here that this is a optical image of a galaxy and just above the galaxy you practically see nothing, it is an empty hole out there. And this was a, even though, even though this optical image has much higher resolution and sensitivity than the infrared image. You can see that this galaxy itself in the infrared images, it looks a lot more smudged, you do not see that much of detail and there are not that many other objects visible in these infrared images. But on the other hand, you see that this object which has been circled is bright in these infrared images but not seen in the optical image at all. This was the point I was making, I made it earlier also that different objects radiate differently in different bands and all of it is necessary for a comprehensive understanding of the object. Secondly, infrared telescopes are wonderful for looking through obscuring gas and dust and that is seen here. This is an optical image and this is an infrared image. In the optical image you just see these clouds of gas and dust and nothing else. But whereas when you look at the infrared image you see large number of stars which are sitting inside these clouds and you would have never known it if you had not observed this cloud with the infrared uh, telescope. In fact, we now know because of these infrared images that such clouds of gas which look dark, do not have much light you can see in the outer region are actually the nurseries in which stars are born. So, this is how you can actually study the birth of stars only through these infrared telescopes otherwise you would not have even known that there was star formation going on there. Then there is that other thing that we are all very interested in as human beings, we want to understand how the universe was formed. As you may have heard in the case of the universe, because it takes light a finite amount of time to come from far away to close to you, the farthest objects in the universe are also being seen when they were very young in the age of the universe, right. So if you want to understand how the universe looked when it was very young, you see very far away. But there is also this phenomenon called the cosmological redshift such in which any radiation which was emitted uh, by an object which was very far away at the time when the universe was very young, by the time such a radiation reaches us, its frequency goes on decreasing or its wavelength goes on increasing. In analogy with the, with the rainbow where the red part of the rainbow has lower frequency of radiation uh, compared to the blue part of the ra uh, rainbow. This transformation of a higher energy or higher frequency photon into a lower energy or lower uh, frequency photon is called a redshift. And in fact, astronomers use the redshift of an object uh, to understand how far it is away from us, right. So, this is what uh, what is actually seen by astronomers when they uh, are using the redshift. What I have shown you here is how radiation intensity changes as a function of wavelength, right, in this image for example. If you took a typical galaxy and observed it at various frequencies within the optical, its intensity which is on the y axis changes in this manner. It starts at some low level at very high uh, wavelengths and becomes higher and higher and then it suddenly abruptly drops and becomes very low, right. But if you observe this galaxy far away, what you would see is that the spectrum is shifted to higher and higher wavelengths or lower and lower frequency. That is why it is called redshift because blue is on this side and red is on this side in this wavelength scale, right. So, shown here are three 
identical galaxies but at redshift is equal to 0, 0 0.4 and 0 0.8. So, the redshift it is uh, indicated using the letter z, it is redshift 0 0.8 means it is very uh, it is a very distant object and a very young object because it was it is being observed at a time when the universe was very young and you can see that the same spectrum is being shifted to higher and higher wavelengths, longer and longer wavelengths or lower frequencies. You know, we can see why if we want to study the early universe or the distant universe, we need a very good infrared telescope. Because as the redshift becomes higher and higher, all those phenomena which were giving you radiation at uh, high frequencies, the same photons will now be detectable only at low frequencies. That is, all the ultraviolet and optical photons will only be detectable at infrared frequencies, which is why you need a very sensitive infrared telescope. That is what being shown here. If these are the three spectral lines, you know what spectral lines are. These are characteristic lines emitted by chemical species, atoms and molecules at particular frequencies and by measuring the wavelength at which they are coming, we know what uh, chemical species they are. This is how people find out what is there in the distant objects, galaxies and stars. So, in this, if such an object was close to us, you would have seen those emission lines at these frequencies or these wavelengths, but the same object found far away would be at much higher a longer wavelengths right this is infrared this is visible light and that's the reason if you want to study the universe at an early stage or the distant universe you need a very sensitive infrared instrument the james webb telescope is also expected to provide us a lot of uh, information about extrasolar planets it's one of the things which many people are excited about because apart from astronomers the public also wants to know if there are if there is life outside our own solar system and you remember all the problems that we talked about complaints that we had about what the uh, atmosphere does to radiation right can be inverted to study the interaction between matter and photons in the atmospheres of distant planets and this is the way people are looking at it here is a some star around which there is this planet which is moving round and round and when the star is when the planet is right in front of the star of course the planet blocks the light from the star uh, in the region where the planet is solid but then the planet also has an atmosphere and because the light from the star is passing through the atmosphere all the absorption processes the scattering process that i talked to you about at an earlier stage you will see the same interaction between the light of this star and the planetary atmosphere and by analyzing the spectrum we can actually figure out what kind of material what kind of chemical species are there in these planets this is a very powerful way of finding out the composition of the atmosphere of these planets because planets by themselves don't emit much light and therefore detecting their chemical species is very difficult but for this phenomenon what is shown in this panel is the spectrum of the planet when it is going just behind the star, just before it goes behind the star on the upper panel and what is shown below is the spectrum that is seen when the planet is in front of the star and the difference between these two gives you the signature of the presence of many organic molecules including uh, methane. CH2, CH3 radicals, water and so on and one of the quest is to ask if there are planets in which there could be chemical species which are es essential for our kind of life on earth. Then I will end with this final one which is also related in some way to planets. What I have shown you here is observations from the space of stars which have a disk around them what has been done is actually the stars have been removed from this image they mask the star because if you have the star also in the field it will be so bright that you can't see the disk they have subtracted the star which is found at the location of these plus symbols out here both in this object and this object and when you subtract the the light of the star what is left behind is a disk like object right and that is shown as a model here 
that there is this bright star here and the disc around it. This is only detected in infrared, you cannot see this in the optical. So, this is one star with a disc and another star with a disc and the belief is that such discs around stars which are typically found in young stars may have been the precursor of planetary systems. So, basically the James Webb Space Telescope, the infrared telescope has been sent up with two major uh, broad fields of enquiry. One is to know the origins of the universe, the high redshift universe, cosmological redshift of the distant early universe and our own origins in terms of can we find life or life-like conditions in other planets outside our own solar system. So, I will stop with that. I will only say that I wish uh, with this exciting telescope going up, I wish I were 30 years younger, but this is a wonderful resource for all of you uh, wanting to become astronomers to be able to take human knowledge of the cosmos to much greater heights with a telescope like the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you very much.